Welcome back, everyone, to this week's episode of the Vancouver Life Real Estate Podcast. We are back this week with none other than the number one mortgage specialist at the Bank of Montreal, Mr. Mikhail Ferreira. And uh, Mikhail, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah. Well, let's not waste any time and let's kind of get into some of the uh, discussion points here that I know a lot of people are thinking as we inch closer to that June 5th rate expectation or rate discussion meeting. And mm -hmm. um, I think uh, we'd kind of like to touch on maybe what the Bank of Montreal is thinking heading towards this meeting, uh, what it could mean for buyers and sellers, because we're starting to see some very interesting shifts taking place in the market right now. And uh, what's going to happen to variable rates versus fixed rates? We'll also touch on some of the uh, inverted yield curves and the potential for recession, all that kind of stuff here. But um, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll start off with the first, uh, the first question, which is the elephant in the room question uh, mm -hmm. around interest rates here. So the U.S. Fed is saying uh, that they're delaying their interest rate cuts uh, because they have a bit more of a robust economy here, although we are starting to see some recent information here that it may not be as strong as they thought. Um, that being said, they're likely going to delay lowering interest rates. They've even discussed maybe not lowering them at all this year. However, the Bank of Canada um, has said that they've got more and more compelling information and evidence that they can begin to cut rates as early as June. Uh, however, they have a very delicate dance in front of them. If they cut rates too soon or too deep, uh, they could crater the Canadian dollar, uh, adding pressure to inflation because we import half a trillion dollars worth of goods every year in Canada, and as such, we would end up paying a lot more for that stuff. Um, if they don't cut rates, Canada will likely almost certainly enter a formal recession. Um, and as the consumer won't be protected and, uh, you know, private companies that need cash to survive, it'll be too restrictive for them and they won't here. So very, very delicate dance that's in front of them here. Um, what in your world are you seeing with respect to this, Mikhail? What does the Bank of uh, Montreal think about what's in front of the BOC? Yeah, so you know, it's uh, it seems to be jumping around a lot. Uh, and, and besides Bank of Montreal, I, th I think there's been a lot of differing opinions. Uh, you know, a few months ago, I, I think with almost you know uh, certainty there would be a cut come June. Uh, you get uh, a couple bad prints, uh, and suddenly we're talking July, maybe fall, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, we get some U.S. Uh, job numbers that maybe aren't as strong. And it seems like June's back on the table. I think Bank of Montreal has been pretty um, solid in the fact that they do believe the cut is still coming June. Uh, myself personally, uh, I believe it might be July, but um, we'll have to see, right? Uh, it's it's anyone's guess really right now. Um, you know, the market really is divided. Like I said, up to uh, last week, I think everyone was June's not happening, and now June's a maybe. Um, but our official call is uh, still uh, June would be the first cut. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, it's just it's one of those things that you just I've never had so much turmoil on a decision. I think even <laughs> from when we were increasing, I think that that was becoming more of a uh, an easier guess than now, because, you know, whether it's June or July, I think we'll see a cut. Now, the interesting part with your comments on the U.S., and how you know their their economy is currently stronger than ours. Ours continues to get weaker month to month, while the U.S. Uh, you know appears to be holding on. Um, besides the the employment numbers, you know I, I think that the U.S. will delay. But you know I was listening to Doug Porter, our chief economist, and he mentioned that we should still be able to have some deviation from the U.S. rates. So you know whether that means we might cut a quarter point first and maybe hang on until the, the states catch catches up uh, that's uh, a reality that we might uh, end up seeing so you know not anticipating a half point cut or anything like that it would mm -hmm. be it would be inches before anything else would happen especially if the us has done nothing uh, i mm -hmm. can't imagine a 50 point uh, cut uh, uh, at this stage um, you know if anything it, i believe it would be a quarter point yeah and i'm i'm with you on that i think uh, yeah. i also think that uh, 
you know, if they cut more than that, it causes, uh, it causes too many people to jump back into the marketplace mm -hmm. and you'll see another deviation in the wrong direction back to yeah. inflation, right? So got to be very careful. I think the Bank of Canada here is delicate situation. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, well, let's move on here. So let's look at some metrics to get a sense of, of, uh, one, not necessarily what the decision will be, but maybe what's going to happen inside of the marketplace. Um, you know, anytime we hear of sort of big changes coming, uh, people typically hedge their bets. And so are you guys seeing an increase in um, mortgage pre-approvals or new mortgage originations? Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know because, um, you know, this is one of the first things buyers will do uh, when they're getting ready to buy a home. And it's a great indicator mm -hmm. to a seller of what's coming in the marketplace. So, you know, I pride myself on the fact that I can get a sense of this just simply by the sheer volume. You know, we do 500 plus applications a year and, you know, you really start to see trends. And I have never seen so much inconsistency over the last few months. Wow. Uh, you look at December, December was quite busy uh, unexpectedly. Like we were not, you know, planning for a busy December. January was quiet. Uh, February started to pick up. March kind of went into a lull, I believe, just, you know, with the, the noise around inflation. Uh, mm -hmm. And then April has just absolutely exploded. And, mm -hmm. you know, I would I would rank uh, in terms of what we're doing the most right now is pre-approvals. And the interesting part about that is we're seeing people who have had pre-approvals from the last two or three years, a year ago, whatever it may be, reaching out now. And mm -hmm. they're now thinking that they want to enter the market now. And I think the, the, the noise around the cuts is like, okay, well, this is it. You know, this is the worst of it. It's time to jump in. However, everyone is still so tentative, right? Everybody's still mm -hmm. kind of getting pre-approved, but waiting. Um, second to those applications, and, and just for, for reference, like we've done more pre-approvals in the last six months than I probably did the whole year before. Wow. So, you know, the the amount of people who are considering and preparing is uh is pretty substantial right and mm. you know that's an interesting you know point of view that you know we got all these people we know the buyers are there right mm -hmm. it's just a matter of what are they all waiting for right second to that probably is our refinances and with all these changes that are coming uh to to market and all these um you know renewals coming up we're looking at people that are switching banks, refinancing, pulling equity, extending amortizations. Uh, and, I, and I suspect we'll see more of that as a lot of these variable mor uh, mortgages come up for the next couple of years. Uh, I think a lot of people will be restructuring their debt um, and investors will probably be accessing equity to take advantage of uh, opportunities in the market. So, you know, I would say those two are, you know, overly saturated right now and then third mm. is a, if we're seeing a lot of pre-sale buyers that are finally closing but you know for reference you know we're seeing three to one um pre-approvals versus refinances right now which is interesting because I, I think it would be the other way around given what's happening with rates no kidding you know it's it's interesting because you you mentioned uh sort of how those months went and when i look back at uh the start of the year the start of the year for me was was exceptionally busy as well mm -hmm. and i think what it was was again um, and maybe this is a little bit of sort of round two from from the market, but December there were people that were looking, and if you go back to December and November, uh, there were rate cuts sort of suggested that it might be mm -hmm. March or April, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think you know, and, and there was a lot of economists saying that, and there were pundits saying it. Um, I'm grateful we never said it, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of people were hedging their bet then and started to mm -hmm. get ready and start getting into the market, buy that property, knowing that a rate cut might be coming. And mm -hmm. then it didn't show up. Yeah. <laughs> at, wh at which point buyers peeled back, peeled back quite substantially. And we're like, well, hold on a second here. If inflation's, you know, still pesky and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're expecting to get some more inventory, maybe we'll wait and see. And then mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened. We ended up getting a, a ton more inventory. It, yeah. it, it, it's, you know, it's a pretty, pretty big change that we've seen. And, and uh, I'll kind of get into that because um, our inventory last month rose enormously. 
So mm-hmm. month over month, we were up 40%. And year over year, we were up 65%. It's, mm-hmm. it's huge, right? So if we get into some hypotheticals here, um, knowing that inventory is rising, um, you know, hearing that the common theme is that buyers are choosing to maybe wait until they see mm-hmm. that first rate cut before they mm-hmm. do anything. Um, mm-hmm. is, that, is that something that you're seeing? Because I know, much like you do, that when mm-hmm. buyers start to dive into the marketplace, the Vancouver yeah. marketplace can turn on a dime, yeah. right? So, you know, what, what, what are you seeing in mm-hmm. terms of, of that respect? Are people waiting for that interest yeah. rate cut? So, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, we ran a survey with uh, many of the Bank of Montreal clients and 70% of the clients said they are waiting for a rate cut, which I think is very interesting because, you know, it seems like the fundamental of real estate in Vancouver is still there. Like it's everybody does everything at the same time, right? And <laughs> know. they don't buy, they all don't buy at the same time. They enter the market, they all enter the market at the same time. I try to give advice to my clients that, look, you know, if you are ready to enter the market, it's not so much about the timing. It's about the property. Find the correct property, something that you're happy with and you're content with buying. And and that could come at any time. But, you know, if you're waiting for this perfect moment with a, a quarter point rate cut, that's really insignificant, honestly, mm-hmm. like, great. We're, we're now going from a 6.5 to a 6.25 on a variable how does that really change the marketplace in terms of affordability? Frankly, it doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. But yet everybody assumes that that is the time to enter. So, you know, I, I feel very strongly about this because, you know, I don't exactly know what it, what they're waiting for in that regard, but I, I can get the overall misunderstanding around rates and, and, and there's a lot of noise and, you know, maybe people think there's going to be this substantial difference. Um, but you know, these are the general opinions of the population. They're all waiting. So, you know, I would not be surprised that once we see that first rate cut, we're going to see an avalanche of people coming into the market. Um, It's just all signs are pointing to it. The pre-approvals are there. The surveys are saying, so, I mean, just talk to anybody They're They're basically waiting for the next couple months. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, I think for a long time. Uh, it, it took me a lot of conversations uh, and a lot of trying to help people understand that, you, you know, when you're going to buy something, you have to do it when other people are not buying if you want a good <laughs> price, right? Yeah. It's when you, when everyone buys what you're trying to buy, the, the cost of that particular good is only going to rise. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but I think there's this, you know, there's this uh, psychological fear that if nobody mm-hmm. else is doing it, that I'm going to get caught out. And yeah. that's just not so something wrong. I think I'm, yeah, and I think that that's just simply not really having a good fundamental understanding of how the marketplace is working and, and the things that mm-hmm. drive it. Um, mm-hmm. So with that said, then, um, looking at the fact that we, we could see rates drop, um, mm-hmm. albeit nominally, um, mm-hmm. if you were looking at fixed rates versus variable rates, variable rates, sorry, um, yeah. Do you have recommendations right now or what, what yeah. most people are, are leaning into? And I know that this is a... a particularly um, unique sort of situation per per person and, and their circumstances mm-hmm. that they're in. But what are you seeing more of right now? And what are people um, opting to do? I'd say 98% of clients right now are taking a three-year fixed. And uh, the reason for specifically with Bank of Montreal, we allow an early renewal six months in advance. So mm-hmm. if you're taking a three-year fixed, that's a two and a half year term that you basically have to hold this rate for. And when you're looking at the sh- the shortest amount of time for the lowest rate, the three year fits that bucket. The two year is quite high, so it doesn't really make sense versus mm-hmm. a variable. But the the market really is split. Most people are comparing. Well, what's a five year variable and what's a three year fixed? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm nervous to make an overall recommendation there because I don't believe it's a one size fits all. Yeah. Um, you know, the variable there's some components of the variable which make it interesting. One, you're paying t- for reference. You know, you're paying about six and a half percent for a variable. You're paying about five percent for a three-year fixed. There's a one point five percent gap. So the question is, how long will you carry a variable for when it, to expect those rates to come down to meet the three-year fixed? Are we talking six months? Are we talking a year? Are we talking eighteen months? Are we talking two years? 
Uh, the other interesting component of a variable is you can actually convert it uh, at any point to a fixed term for equal or greater uh, term left. So if you're on a five-year variable, you're a year in, you can convert it to a four-year fix. So let's say a year from now, uh, a, a four-year fixed is at, you know, 4.8%. Well, you know, does the math make sense? And, and I've, I've toyed around with the numbers. I've played multiple scenarios. It's so hard to really tell someone this will make sense in this particular scenario <laughs> because we, do, we don't really know if that scenario will hit. So mm-hmm. I make the recommendation. It's like, look, there's two, two options here. One's a dice roll. It could very well play out. You can convert it to a fixed at a lower rate down the road. Um, but you're going to pay a premium for that, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to pay a 1.5% premium, right? Whereas a three or fix, it's the devil you know. It's the same payment. There's no deviation. It, it is what it is. You chew on that rate for two and a half years, and then you early renew it into whatever the market is at that time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think everyone's a little bit, uh, you know, scared of the variable. I think investors understand it, and they're sometimes willing to take that risk. But I'd say the first time home buyer, the person refinancing out of their variable is choosing the three-year fix. And I tend to lean that way. I've always been, uh, uh, you know, a person that has recommended fixed. There was just that short period of time when there was a huge spread with variable and mm-hmm. using previous data, we're like, okay, there's, you know, worst case scenario, rates go up 1%. In an absolute nightmare scenario, they go 2%. And it still made sense. So, you know, I've learned a valuable lesson from that, that, you know, making sure whatever you recommend, uh, it really has to be the right fit for that person. And they got to know what they're taking on. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a tough one. I think from a value perspective, the three year might inch out the, the, the variable, uh, at least for the next two and a half years. But, you know, Tiff has really, you know, he's come out and said now that, oh, rates are going to be high for a while. We're going to slowly reduce rates. We're going to, while we're you know, tackling inflation, that sounds awfully familiar to me mm-hmm. because you go back a few years and rates will be low for a very long time. Go ahead and borrow. So have, are they over promising certain things again? And all of a sudden we're going to see a 2% drop next year, you know? So it, it, it's so hard and I think it's so situational. Um, but I think overall, the, the the majority of people are going with the three year fix, and I truly believe that that's you might get caught, you know, paying a little bit of a higher rate for a little bit longer, but not forever. Two and a half years is a reasonable amount of time versus a five year. I agree. That's all really, really good information, and I, I want to build off of your comments about Tiff here. Not that I'm picking on him, but um, <clears throat> he's easy to pick on. But that yeah. said. Um, I wanted to touch on this because uh, it, it almost got no headlines and, and no uh, no attention. Mm-hmm. But last week, the United States Treasury market made history for the longest continuous inversion of the U.S. twos and tens ever. That's the the U.S. the, the yield curve I'm talking about. The yield curve has now been continuously inverted since July fifth. 2022, passing the 624-day inversion from 1978, which currently held the record. Um, Now, with only one exception, the inverted yield curve has signaled every single recession since 1955. And interestingly, in 2007, the inverted yield curve was 16 months in duration before we went into the Great Recession. We are way beyond 16 months now. And, you know, when we talk about could rates drop 2%, well, it really depends on how this economy continues to pan out and whether or not we end up turning on money printers on the other side of this too. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't even want to laugh about it, but I saw a headline yesterday about the new H1N5 virus that could be a new pandemic if it spreads beyond uh, you know, cows and birds and gets into human beings. And it's kind of like, haven't we been here before? You know, it's all, it's all sort of, um, it's a little bit scary. And I, and I, you know, I, I joke a little bit, but at the end of the day, when you consider the fact that the inverted yield curve has been inverted for as long as it has, I would argue that there could be more pain in front, um, more on, on maybe the business side of the economy than maybe the home buying side, because 
typically the home buying side tends to lead the business recovery. So um, very interesting sort of time we find ourselves in, uh, you know, but I, I guess I'll move on from that because it's a point I really wanted to make and a point I mm -hmm. think people should be aware of that we're not out of the woods just yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that things could get worse, you know? Yeah. But, um, with, with that said, you know, affordability, we hasn't, hasn't recovered at all, uh, at, at this point, it's still extremely expensive. Um, I I'm seeing it everywhere where we're negotiating rates or, 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 uh, negotiating prices on, on property here. Um, in your world, how sensitive are buyers today, uh, versus they were a couple years ago? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I, I, I remember when we were, you know, subject free on properties and we were offering 50 or $100,000 over the asking yeah. price. Now we can't get five to $10,000 over. And that's mm -hmm. due in part to restrictive credit and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, how, are, how are buyers dealing with this kind of affordability? Where are they seeing their money? How is it getting to them? Yeah. So... I've definitely seen a, a lot more transfer of wealth, especially for first time home buyers. Um, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, clients that are purchasing their first homes, you know, they're, they're dealing with, you know, record high interest rates right now. So, you know, if they're going to be buying a home that's, you know, arguably hasn't really shifted too much in price in the last few years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're going to need a bigger down payment just, just from a qualifying standpoint and also a payment standpoint. So, we're starting to see, you know, parents and family members, uh, you know, move large amounts of money over to the kids. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more people co-signing, a lot more dual income, mm -hmm. triple income, quadruple files, um, people just trying to make it work. Now, the interesting part with um, the pre-approvals that I'm seeing is that when those clients are converting, they seem to be content with where prices are at and the ability to negotiate and the ability to do their due diligence. Mm -hmm. And as a buyer, that's all you could really hope for. I mean, we're not going to see necessarily immediately, at least these big changes in price. So, you know, when you go back, you know, when people were paying 50, a hundred thousand subject free, you know, there was a lot of FOMO, right? It was a lot of people just had to get in no mm -hmm. matter what it was just spiraling out of control. Uh, but now, you know, while they are, you know, it, even if clients are, are, are winning on, on offers, they're winning even by the, you know, by, by $1,000 or $5,000. So I'm not seeing so much, um, you know, nervousness around price per se. Um, I'm seeing more, the client, the buyers are, are more happy to do their due diligence and to get all these things and to actually activate parents' help. So, you know, it, it is something that uh, I think is, is very interesting because price is going to be price. It's just whether or not you're paying way over that, which isn't the case. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with where your money is coming from because I, we, we get questions all the time. You know, mm -hmm. who's buying real estate in Vancouver? You know, when mm -hmm. you make a, uh, when you make fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you know, yeah. to service the kind of debt that uh, a Vancouver property can generate, you know, people are like, well, who, who's buying that? Because how can how can their income service it? Mm -hmm. But like you're saying, mm -hmm. you're seeing a whole lot of transfer of wealth taking place, and I mm -hmm. think I think people need to remember that. And <clears throat> I think also it's important to recognize that only fifty percent of properties in Vancouver have yeah. mortgages. Right, that's the key. <laughs> That's the key thing that a lot of people need to realize when they're saying who is buying these homes. Well, it's it's the parents that are essentially buying the homes. Yeah, um, we're yeah. not seeing a lot of uh, you know, uh, we're not there's not as much of a foreign uh, you know buyer mm -hmm. you know Cont contingent the anymore. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the parents need to help the kids, right? There's yeah. there's no way around it. I mean, how is somebody who's 25 years old trying to buy a townhome? you know, with maybe their small family going to, you know, come up with two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. It's just it's impossible. Yeah. So <laughs> and that that's the answer is the fact that there's still a lot of clear title homes. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Well, Mikhail, this has been uh really interesting. I, I really appreciate your time. Mikhail, if we've got uh, people who are looking to get finance themselves, um, what's mm -hmm. the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can send me an email or shoot me a message on Instagram or give me a call anytime. I'm always happy to help and provide any support. 
What's your what's your Instagram handle? Mikhail Mortgages. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Right on, Mikhail. Well, thanks again. And uh, looking forward to uh, having a discussion with you post-rate hopeful cut uh, as yes. of June, maybe July. And uh, we'll see what the impacts have for the market at that time. Until then, thanks again. And uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you so much.